So our next speaker, also former guest uh, of the podcast, former guest of uh, Epicenter, Robin Hansen. He is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a research associate at the Future Humanity Institute of Oxford University. Previously in his career, he's worked at Lockheed and NASA. Um, so, you know, Robin is a, is, a, is a pioneer of the concept of prediction markets uh, and has focused a lot of his research on prediction markets or information markets. He also uh, invented this, this concept of futarchy, which is a form of governance based on prediction markets. If you're interested in that, you can listen to his episode on Epicenter. Um, uh, his most recent book is uh, The Elephant in the Brain, and he blogs at uh, overcomingbias.com. And today he's going to give us a talk uh, that I first heard over at the, uh, the Foresight uh, event, um, which we've mentioned many times uh, throughout the day, which is about variolation, which is deliberate contamination of COVID in order to um, you know, make some people or a, population, a portion of the population at least immune, although according to the WHO, well, who knows? <laughs> so give it over to you, Ryan. Uh, Robin, sorry. <laughs> Hello, uh, I guess you can hear me and I'm ready to go. Hello one and all. Uh, I've been listening to some other of the events here today, but uh, I intend to give a relatively short talk and have lots of Q&A because this is a community I don't know that well and uh, I wanna interact more. So uh, I'm an economist. A, I've done a lot of things over my life. I'm relatively theoretical and this topic here is somewhat more applied because when this pandemic showed up, many of us said, oh my goodness, something happening in our lives that's big and important, uh, let's dive in and try to do something. Um, so as you know, uh, this showed up in China first and China and initially did a bad job of, of uh, dealing with it, but then turned all around and had a very aggressive approach to dealing with it, which seems to have so far succeeded. And a number of other Asian countries have also uh, had similar aggressive approaches done early on when they first started to have a few cases. And those also seem so far to be relatively successful. And here in the West, not just the United States, but also in Europe, uh, we didn't jump on it early and we didn't copy the sorts of policies that they did in the Asian countries that worked. We were much more uh, lax and forgiving and um, loose about things and uh, it spread. And uh, it's now, uh, now the usual approach early in a pandemic, which is what these other countries do, is what they call test and trace. Uh, you try to find individual cases and then you see who they've had contact with and you go look at those people and you see if they're sick or if they're suspected then you isolate them and you make sure uh, they don't uh, interact with anyone. And that's the usual approach for most pandemics for a long time. And it works if you can catch it early enough and if you get enough signatures that somebody's sick or uh, you just catch enough people around them. Uh, in the West, we failed at that uh, for a variety of reasons. And so uh, we now have this thing going much farther than any disease before that's ever been successfully uh, contained through this sort of uh, test and trace approach. Um, and so uh, as it spread around the United States and Europe, many public health experts basically said, um, I guess we're gonna switch to what they call mitigate or flatten the curve. We can't contain this, but uh, we will try to make sure that it doesn't have too big a spike of everybody getting sick all at the same time so we can spread it out over time. And uh, in order to do that, one of the things we wanna do is to uh, limit exposure and, and spreading. So some degree of uh, social distancing and lockdown uh, is the reasonable thing to do to prevent uh, that, but of course, only for a limited time. And then um, a lot of talking heads and people talked about that early on and they said, no, 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 <laughs> we, we can't do that. <laughs> that means this spreads and most people get it, that, that's unacceptable. And so people said, no, the, our priority must be to prevent everybody from getting this. Uh, and so we just must do whatever it takes to do that. And I think the uh, public health experts and the politicians were somewhat taken aback and got, okay, fine. But, uh, yes, that's our policy officially, yes, yes. And so they embraced the lip service of saying, of course we will contain this and, and we will uh, do everything we can, but they didn't really embrace the substance of that in the sense that uh, they haven't massively expanded testing or tracing capacities and they um, 
didn't like try hard to copy the entire package of the Asian uh, policies that, that worked. Uh, they sort of said, no, we, we, we're going to do our own version and, you know, and it has to be our, our people and doing it our way. But uh, yeah, that's our priority. And so um, here where I live, I've so far been under roughly six weeks of lockdown. And um, in the United States, we seem to be reaching a, uh, you know, reduction in the rate of growth, but not really shrinking. And there's a you know, if we just stay that hover level, then we're just, you know, taking up time and energy to, to hover, but not really making progress one to the other and suffering a lot of uh, social and economic pain from that. So um, I uh, did a cost benefit analysis recently, and I roughly guessed that uh, if basically just everybody got infected, uh, you know, as many as probably would if we just let it go everywhere uh, with the sort of infection fatality rate, we've seen best estimate of say half a percent then uh, the total harm of just letting this go everywhere and letting a lot of people die is equivalent to roughly four months of stronger lockdown. So that means that lockdown is pretty expensive. If you make it go on too late, you may you know, spend more on the lockdown than you are saving in preventing uh, people from getting hurt. Uh, and so you could end up, of course, with the worst of both worlds where um, you make a lot of social and economic pain and still it goes everywhere a few months later anyway. And so we're actually at substantial risk of that scenario. So uh, all of which is to say, uh, we need a plan B. Uh, that is, people are giving lip service to this idea that uh, we're going to keep it limited, uh, but that's actually going to be very hard because we've never done that at this level before. And my guess is we won't. Uh, we should try, but we should also ask, well, if we fail, what are we gonna do then? How are we going to manage this uh, if you know, it goes most everywhere? And say a third or a half of people eventually get infected. Uh, now, that brings up like various kinds of things we might do in that scenario. And um, of course, there are, you know, may, many uh, potential approaches that people are discussing, and I'm going to discuss some a little later. But the most, one of the most straightforward and interesting ones is to try to control who gets infected when. So, um, you know, usually, basically, people get accidentally infected wherever they happen to get infected. Uh, but there are a number of advantages of choosing who gets infected when. Um, so for example, uh, basically the lockdown is trying to prevent the people who happen to be infectious at this moment from being their other people. But since we don't know who those are, we're locking down everybody. So the, the, the efficiency there is very low in the sense that of, the of all the people we're locking down, the fraction who are actually infectious at the moment is very tiny. But if you deliberately infect someone and then immediately isolate them, those isolation resources are 100% efficient. They are being exactly used on the people who are infectious to prevent them from infecting others. So as you deliberately infect people, uh, you are much more efficient with your isolation resource. You can also be more efficient with your um, medical resources in the sense that um, near the peak of the pandemic, things may be very tight and, and resources are very uh, limited. But if you infect people deliberately early, then at that time, the medical system isn't overwhelmed. And so it's much less of a problem. Uh, but these benefits I've just mentioned are actually small compared to the biggest potential benefit, which is that we can cut the rate of death and the rate of um, severe illness uh, substantially plausibly. So the name uh, for that is variolation. And that's taken from the example of smallpox several centuries ago. Uh, in Europe, people basically died a lot from smallpox, uh, but some people in Europe learned that in the Middle East, in uh, China, and in Africa, uh, they had traditionally done a version of deliberate infection that had a much lower death rate. And uh, for example, uh, the person who brought it to England was someone who uh, was an ambassador, her wife of an ambassador to Turkey. And uh, the person who brought it to the United States uh, Took, got it from slaves who had, uh, who in Africa had had, uh, had this done, and uh, variolation or deliberate infection with uh, smallpox basically reduced the death rate from say um, you know, ten to thirty percent of people dying from smallpox down to one to two percent of people dying from smallpox. A huge factor, and uh, that was apparently um, a combination of uh, a lower dose and that they had a small you know, uh, dried pus that they used and a different place that went in through the skin. 
and that's a huge factor reduction. We've seen also uh, substantial dose effects with many other viruses. Uh, and the, uh, so for example, for measles in one study, uh, people who got the infection at home with somebody else who was infected there and therefore got a large dose, uh, they had died 14 times more often than someone who caught the uh, measles outside of the home. And even for SARS, which is closely related to the current uh, virus, um, just looking at a variation of people who are three times closer uh, to a apartment complex that was admitting uh, the virus, uh, they died um, closer, died three times more often. So for a, a, a number of viruses, we have this apparent effect where uh, the smaller the dose that you initially get infected with is the weaker your uh, symptoms and the less chance of dying. Um, and so variolation is this idea that with we can get less uh, infection, less uh, death, uh, with not just a choice of dose, but also a choice of where it comes in the body. So for example, through the skin, um, apparently it's probably better than through the lungs, which is where this particular disease uh, does the most damage. Uh, you might also say through a pill that goes into the digestive system. Um, that may also reduce this a lot. And the, uh, we may also be have different strains out there that have different degrees of uh, severity and if we could find the better strain. So um, there are a number of different possibilities. What we mainly need to do is just have a small trial where we vary the dose and uh, for perhaps also the vector of delivery, i.e. where it comes into the body. And um, you know, even 100 people find out what, which ones work better and then we can let a larger population get a deliberate infection. And this deliberate infection not just cannot just um, reduce the death rate, of course, through controlled infection, we could also infect the people who are the, the safest, i.e. the young and healthiest, so that we can reach herd immunity with the um, old and sick, and say basically never having been infected. And so controlled infection lets us choose who gets infected in that way. And we can also infect, say, critical care workers, uh, military, uh, health workers, et cetera, police, um, earlier in the process so that then when there's a peak and, and a lot of people are sick and not available, they're reliably available for work. Um, now, the main um, limitation is to do these studies and there are a lot of, there's money available to do studies, there's uh, people, lots of people willing to volunteer to them, but apparently uh, the standard authorities in this area, the uh, ethics boards, the internal review boards uh, say no. Uh, they basically so far said, well, now there've been a bunch of op-eds and a lot of people writing articles and things saying this is a good idea, but the authorities say, nope, nope, this is not, not gonna allow that. And the standard is, well, you know, we're not gonna change our usual procedures here for this uh, unusual crisis uh, because we just have a usual way of doing things. And look, you know, for example, it's designed around vaccines, which uh, can be very safe, but every once, you know, some, some of them are, are bad and, and do things worse. And so they basically, they need to do a standard set of trials before we can allow the vaccine, which is why people say it's gonna be 18 months or even more, or perhaps never that we would get a vaccine. And they say, uh, you know, people say with respect to doing a variolation trial, we say, well, you know, that's gonna be much more risky because uh, the chance of, of getting harmed is higher. And they also say things like, uh, well, we can't know the chance of harm. They, so they say things like, you need informed consent to let people be on this thing. And informed consent means you need to know the risk level. So if the risk level is uncertain, then it's not informed consent, which seems kind of crazy to me because we take a lot of risks where we don't know the risk level. But I, I would think informed consent means you, you have been told as much as we know about the risk. You have been informed as much as we know, but uh, demanding that we know things that we don't know uh, seems kind of crazy. And of course, we let a lot of people take big risks for our society. We have soldiers, we have police, we have firemen, we have doctors and nurses, uh, and we let them take big risks for all of us. And, and that's, uh, we celebrate them for that. But for medical trials, we say, no, you're not allowed to take a substantial risk. Uh, and then we make this excuse about, well, you don't, you're not, don't know enough about it. So um, obviously for variolation, we do know the risk in the sense that, you know, it's gonna be the risk of actually getting infected, hopefully less, but that's, some sense, the worst case is you'll get the usual dose that people usually get, and we know what the risk of that is. And we're facing a situation where uh, likely a large fraction of the population is going to get it. So if we could prevent that, like a factor of three to 30 reduction in death rates by uh, doing a small trial, the ethics of that seems obvious to me and obvious, I think, to most ethicists, but uh, we have a system where that's currently not allowed. Now, um, so um, that's the concept of variolation and deliberate infection. And uh, let me just say that um, 
you know, basically our system of medical ethics and medical regulation is just showing itself to be inflexible and that's costing us in this uh, crisis. Uh, early on, of course, the uh, ethics and regulation of testing was badly uh, delayed. The introduction of substantial testing in the United States, for example, uh, uh, badly delayed the uh, distribution and manufacture of uh, masks and things like that. And uh, we are you know, facing a situation where we are seeing that our governance here in the West is just not up to this sort of uh, crisis very well. And badly, embarrassingly, uh, the East has done better, perhaps because they have had more change lately, so they're more flexible, or because uh, they had diseases closer to them more recently, which uh, gave them warning, or because they're more authoritarian and that works better in this sort of situation. Um, I've given some thought to how we could deal better with uh, pandemics in general without uh, the necessity of, of the central governance solution, which um, often works badly. And um, I'll just briefly say that the key problem, of course, with uh, pandemics is the infection externality. Some people hurt other people by infecting them. Uh, but the standard solution to externalities in law is tort, i.e. liability. We, we sue people. You, you punch me, I get to sue you for compensation. And so the straightforward general solution to something like uh, pandemics in general would be to let you sue somebody for infecting them. Now, there's a number of complexities there, one of which is uh, what if they don't have any money, but with automobiles, we typically require automobile liability insurance so that it can't go out in your car unless you uh, have insurance that will pay if you have an accident. So I propose that in order to let people having a passport to exit from a lockdown, we uh, require that they buy infection liability insurance, which will cover that if they infect someone, uh, their liability insurance company will pay a lot of money as damages. And then I propose that also to get this passport to escape the lockdown that you are required to collect information that would make us possible for us to figure out that you had infected someone, i.e. Uh, an app to trace where you go when, maybe some spit samples regularly uh, that we could go back and look at, and uh, maybe temperature reading, things like that. And that sort of thing would be seem to be enough uh, with some other complications that I, I describe in a, in a blog post uh, to allow the fear of getting sued for infecting someone to allow to mitigate people's behavior so that we don't have to have this very crude regulatory approach to lockdown where we just tell everybody to do the same thing. Uh, that's very expensive relative to the optimal behavior of being personally careful about who you might be near, how, in what way, and what, how vulnerable they are, and how likely you are to be infected, all those sorts of things that an optimal behavior would do. Uh, hopefully liability would, would induce that and say, even on the road, uh, when you are liable, if you might crash into someone, that gives you incentives to be careful and to pay attention to whether it's raining and whether you fix your brakes and all those sorts of things. And so uh, that might be a general approach to the future. The, 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 you know, the biggest thing I might wanna say is that um, what we should most be getting out of this pandemic experience is practice at the next even bigger pandemic when it comes. Uh, we wanna be learning from this about how our systems work well or badly and how to fix them to deal with a bigger problem. This is actually relatively modest in terms of the death rate compared to other diseases that have come along randomly. Uh, it's highly infectious and unfortunately it infects when people don't show symptoms, but we could get another disease that has those features and a much higher death rate. And if we were as prepared for that as we are for this one, we would suffer vastly more than we are suffering here. Anyway, I'm going to stop there and I look forward to talking and uh, interacting with the question and answer. Thanks, Robin. Uh, since, uh, since you gave this talk over at Foresight a couple of weeks ago, I, I've been thinking a lot about this idea. And you, you said something just now, which, which I've also been thinking a lot about, is that you know, th this is practice for the next one. This is practice for the next big pandemic. And you know, the ability to uh, experiment with things like variolation, um, I think like whether it's variolation or other other experiments that would allow us to be more flexible and, and to, to better adapt in a, in a future setting is absolutely desirable. And I think it's something that like governments should massively invest in or like support, you know, um, by reducing some of the barriers that, that Mark was talking about earlier. Um, let's open it up for questions. So there's a couple of questions in here. I'll give the mic over to uh, Pete. Where are you, Pete? Oh, thank you. All right. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, hi. Uh, I mean, a couple things. My, my first 
thought is, I mean, the current administration hasn't been able to administrate a shelter in place. I mean, the administration aside, I live in the states, the, 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 the state governments all the way through haven't really done a great job at administrating a shelter in place, as we see with the numbers. How would we trust a government to administrate this program that you're talking about with a minimum loss of life? So you might notice I didn't propose the government to do something here. Uh, I would mainly propose they get out of the way. I'm assuming whatever you're proposing is with is is within a short order of time, and there aren't there aren't other. Well, or are you so so the main thing that they need to make it legal to try to do a trial, to test if this works, and then they need to make it legal for people to actually go get deliberately infected. They, so they're in the way, and they need to get out of the way. Who's testing if it works? They don't have to decide who tests. They just have to stop telling people not to test. A lot of people would like to test this. We don't have to decide who that is in administrative program. Testing, just giving out, testing, giving out the virus. There are lots of organizations who do tests of various things. I'm in contact with various medical experts who are, who would like to do this test, who have set up and tried to do the test and have been told, no, they can't do the test. So I am saying, just let them do the test. If you want to do a test to see if herd immunity will, will will we'll save more lives? You, how do you no, test that? No, the test is whether the dose effect that we believe is likely there is actually there by infecting people with different doses and seeing the uh, degree of the dose effect. And then assuming the dose effect is substantial, letting people actually be deliberately infected uh, by requesting it. So my, my particular proposal, I call the hero hotel, if you like, there's a place you go, you pay to go there, unless maybe we should subsidize it, but a uh, simple thing is just to make it legal. Right. You walk in the door, and you are immediately infected. And then we check that you are infected. And once you're infected and uh, past the initial stage, then you can socialize with other people in this hotel, but we don't let you leave until you are uh, no longer infectious. Uh -huh. and, I see. and so we just have to allow that. And a lot of people would be willing to do that now because they can get back to work and they can get back to socializing once they come out the other end. They would have to test out of that hotel. Right, exactly. I see, okay. And so that, I mean, that would be the obvious product I would want to offer because otherwise you are producing yeah. externality of people who are infectious and go expose to see. other people, right? So I this see. is definitely not the same as just let everybody get exposed and get infected uh -huh. fast. Okay. This is very, a very program of <laughs> infecting people and then uh, deliberately isolating them until they're uh, no longer infectious. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's much less controversial um, than I thought you were saying. Uh, my, but my second question really is you talked about this, this belief in liability and people would have liability. I mean, we have a current system right now where corporations, given their current liabilities, have literally destroyed our planet and committed a genocide on species across the planet. So why should we trust this liability to be a way to administrate what you're talking about? We have a limited number of ways to deal with what we call externalities in our world and society. Uh, regulation is one of them. So for, say for pollution, we typically um, regulate, say, your car and that it has to have a muffler and exhaust control. Has and, that worked? Well, it, it is one of our things we do and that it works better than I, if we didn't have it. I, Similarly, I, law, law is this ancient system. People, I, we use I, law, I, we're, we don't want to throw law away, so let's use law to, as best our we environmental, can. I, I don't, our environmental laws have not worked. It's part of the reason why we have the current pandemic. So I, that, that's a whole nother panel. Okay. But, but if you just say our society doesn't work, therefore let's just close down our entire society and, and do no. nothing we ever do in our society, that's crazy. We, we, yeah, we, we want to do what we do and then try to do better. We shouldn't base it on the very things. The legal system has been exploited to exploit the planet. So we shouldn't base our future solutions on the very things that have been exploited. We are a large, complicated society full of lots of little mechanisms that work roughly in various contexts. We shouldn't we cancel and destroy our entire society. Law is one of our main mechanisms in society for keeping the peace between people. Let's not throw it away. That's a very good case for deconstructing our current society. Let's perhaps also leave it open for, for other questions. Pete, if you just have a, a final follow-up question, uh, I'd like to open it up for others as well. Okay, um, uh, Navid, I think you had a question too. Hi there. Um, yeah, great, great to talk. Um, uh, I guess you've probably seen Stanford uh, says Santa Clara has 4% community uh, infect, you know, infection rate through antibody testing. LA says the same thing, New York's higher. 
So basically this wasn't available, right? You know, this is April, uh, this is stuff from April. Um, and so the infection rate in the community is 30 to 40, 50 times, you know, these guys are saying, not me, higher than, uh, than the case fatality rates. So anyway, that sort of changes, you know, the worldview on this. Um, and, you know, they have a, they have a perspective. I think you've probably seen it. Anyway, just wanted to get your comments on that. Cause it kind of, you know, that with the fact that the people are really affected or have comorbidities 95% of the time based on Italy, U S and, uh, in, in Spain stats. So it's kind of changes your, you know, the, the view on what you need to do here, right? If you're old and you're, you're, you know, you have cancer, or diabetes, hypertension, you're vulnerable. But like, you know, if you look at back to the healthy population, zero to 45, it's way different worldview. Just wanted to get your comment. So there's basically two scenarios to consider here. One is that the conventional wisdom that we've had up until recently is roughly right, and that's the analysis uh, which gives the prediction, say, of an infection fatality rate of about a half percent. And that's the estimate on which I would say letting everybody get infected uh, naturally would lead to about as much harm as four months of lockdown. Now, the other scenario is that we've misled, misread this, and in fact, the infection fatality rate is much lower because a lot more people are infected than we realize. I'm not very convinced of that, but if that were true, uh, what that means is that the harm of, from letting most everybody get infected is much lower than you thought, a factor of 10 or 10 to 30 or so, in which case the uh, equivalent amount of locked on that produces a similar harm is also a, 10, a factor of 10 or 30 or more, i.e. only a couple of weeks, which we've already done. And so, under that scenario, it, it makes it very hard to justify continued lockdown. It means uh, mostly we should back off of that and uh, mostly let it spread, um, you know, ma managing it as best we can. Uh, the relation to deliberate infection, of course, uh, the smaller the harm uh, either way, the less anything matters, but still lowering that could still be better in the sense that uh, even if it's a low risk, lowering it by a factor of 10 or 30 would still be uh, a win. It just won't be as big a win as if the death rate is higher. So. Um, the attraction of deliberate infection is still there, even if the death rate is lower, uh, because the more people are infected. Um, and of course, in that situation, the prospect that we're going to contain this thing is much less, i.e. we've already let it spread far larger than we realize. The, the chances that we're going to lock this thing down go way, way down, which means you should just give up on this idea that we're going to contain this thing and think about how to manage the process where most everyone gets infected soon. Uh, deliberate infection variolation could be a part of that if we could do a trial soon enough, uh, but lockdowns in that case definitely look like a pretty bad idea. So I think William uh, also had a question. William. If you guys could raise your hands, it's easier to find you uh, in the Zoom. Here we go. William, go ahead. Hi, Robin. You uh, may know me as Mr. Gunn on Twitter. We've spoken a little bit. I've seen you in various um, fora. Uh, you really, uh, it seems like, kind of doing quite the, the media blitz about this. And um, uh, I noticed that I'm surprised that someone who's an economist um, is choosing to be so aggressive um, to talk about a thing where uh, you know, they're, they're not an expert and their recommendations could cause a lot of harm. And I'm just kind of wondering what, what was your thought process that led you to um, uh, decide that this is something you really needed to uh, aggressively promote in the way that you have? Of other things. And in every area that I deal with, uh, that everyone must make a judgment about which aspects um, of that topic uh, are farther outside their expertise or uh, that they should be more uncertain about. Um, so uh, most, when economists deal with most anything, say electricity or defense or anything like that, we try to be careful to separate the areas where uh, there are you know, topic specific expertise that uh, have drawing estimates and then we're, we're combining that with our economic expertise. And of course, we usually want to defer to the topic experts on the parameters and uh, features 
that they know the most about, but when they draw a lot of social conclusions about uh, how we should interact and behave, uh, regulate, uh, trade, contract, et cetera, that's when the economists will say, well, now you're in my territory and you're making judgments about things I know best, and then I feel more confident in stepping in there. So of course, uh, I teach, for example, law and economics. I'm not a lawyer, but I can learn enough law to know about uh, where to reach the economics part of that. Um, I'm not a criminal, but I can talk about crime. Uh, and uh, you know that's just the usual trade-off in any of these. So certainly here, uh, there's been plenty of medical experts who have definitely said that variolation is a thing. It happened before, it could work now. And they have clearly said that the main issue about whether they do or don't it is certain ethical choices that they're making. And so I feel as an economist where we talk a lot about ethics and have a, have a stance on that, I feel quite qualified in addressing those ethical choices, accepting their judgments about the factual situation, uh, mostly in terms of uh, you know the, the estimates they've made. So in my analysis, I have not disputed with medical ex experts about the medical parameters or you know stances about the infection rate here or the chance of uh, immunity or um, you know complications or all those sorts of things. But nevertheless, uh, when we're talking about making social choices as a consequence of those expert parameters. Um, I'm an expert and I can speak up. So how would you know when um, you were you know, um, uh, overstepping? There's so, I mean, there's so many areas of uncertainty right now that, um, that are based on the biology that really do underpin your, um, your proposal. And, and so well, why, I, I, given I that a lot of uncertainty, people, you know- I hear how, a lot of people basically saying, um, there's a lot of uncertainty, so let's just do the standard thing, <laughs> right? You know, this is a common sort of form of argument that I don't respect much, which is just to say, the world's a complicated place and analysis is difficult and there's so much uncertainty and you should never be very sure of anything and therefore I'm right and you should do it my way. Okay, that but that's not actually pretty, what I was like, gonna say. Right? What, I was go what I was gonna say was I noticed that I'm surprised at how aggressively you've been pushing this in the context of how much is unknown. And I was just curious about like, I mean, it sounds like it's more than just you're an economist and this is what economists do. The, um, you know, when I can see that the experts will claim the issue is an area that's something within my bailiwick, then I'm much less concerned about they're right and I'm wrong because of something that's their expert. If they were making a claim that it was some very particular expert thing they understand that I don't, then I would have to be much more cautious about that. Um, and of course, I'm making a relatively weak claim here, I think, which is just we should let a few hundred people do a small trial to find out if we could cut the death rate over the entire population is going to get this thing by a factor of, you know, three to 30. Like the, the, the moral calculation there is really straightforward and all the ethicists I've talked to uh, about it say that's obvious too, the economists, and even the medical doctors say, yes, that calculation is right, but they say they have these ethics about why they do, how they do these things. But, but you're not going to, um, you're sort of substituting your own ethical judgment in here. Um, and not, it's, it's like you'll take their, their advice on what the, uh, uh, the infection rate may or may not be or the, how immunity may or may not last, but you won't necessarily say that you know, agree with their ethical judgment about what informed consent is and why it's important and so on. Yes, so fundamental to economics is a stance on how to do ethical analysis. Uh, we economists have a standard way we make recommendations about policy, and it, of course, uh, may conflict with somebody's ethical judgment, but we nevertheless endorse it and uh, consistently agree together that uh, we like the way we do ethics. So yes, I'm going to uh, embrace that and uh, communicate it. I'm going to pass it over to Anatoly now, who has a question or comment. This is a very, I was expecting this to be such a controversial topic here. Go ahead, Anatoly. Yeah, uh, thanks for economic perspective on that. Um, and so I would like to ask, there was a lecture from Professor Barlett, uh, if I don't mistake, about arithmetics, population, and energy. Have you uh, heard of it? That doesn't sound familiar, no. 
Okay, so that was basically about logarithmic function and that population, when population doubles, all the resources um, the population needs um, to consume are also like increasing. And then there is a point when there is insufficient resources, but the point is when it's too late for the population to like survive without any means of uh, regulating itself. So if population will not regulate uh, itself, uh, like in artificial manner, then will be like natural ways of regulations. These are wars, <laughs> these are natural like crises and also diseases. Um, as economists, have you seen the rise of these like natural factors that are um, decrease the population? Uh, uh, have you seen some some of the evidence? Um, like, but I hope you understand what what, what is the the curve I'm speaking about. Thank you. So, um, I mean, this is a standard, well-known topic. Uh, uh, in economics and uh, when talking about population, which is that for the vast majority of animal history and the vast majority of human history, uh, we lived at what we call near a subsistence level where uh, the uh, population, the, the, the tendency of the population to rise was countered by uh, disease and famine and war and these things so that in equilibrium, uh, the, the you know, people were poor. Uh, and suffered a lot. Um, the big change has been in the last few centuries when we have been able to grow the world economy faster than the population has grown and so that the wealth per person has grown. Uh, that's been largely celebrated and, um, and people of course wonder whether it will last forever and some people sort of too easily assume it will last forever but there's no uh, guarantee there. It's about whether we invent new ways to grow the population faster than we have before. We've been inventing new ways to grow the economy, but not new ways to grow the population. And in fact, my book, The Age of M, Work, Love and Life and Robots for the Earth is about a future where robots find ways to grow very quickly. And so they move back to subsistence, subsistence levels and are living um, at you know sort of subsistence income. Uh, their lives aren't so miserable in the sense that uh, they're in an advanced economy and they can spread out uh, risk. And so they don't really have to suffer much from disease and famine, but they have to work most of the time. So. This idea that uh, you know, if we grow too fast or too much, then uh, nature will rein us in is a well-known concept and um, a standard concern. And I don't think it's especially relevant for this pandemic because uh, we're still pretty rich and this pandemic isn't gonna kill very many of us even if we do it the worst way. Uh, but it reminds us perhaps that there are these uh, larger issues of how far um, humans will grow and what sort of limitations will um, stop us from growing as far as we want. Okay, there's another question here. Scratcher. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, I enjoyed listening to you. I enjoyed listening to uh, cross thinkers, queer thinkers of Deutsch, people who think <laughs> not up and down hierarchically, but kind of outside. And uh, okay, it's my first time zooming. Uh, uh, I see a lot of similarities here. Uh, I, I'm going to ramble a bit. Uh, tell me when to stop and tell me, I don't have... Uh, well, well, we have another speaker in about four or five minutes. Let's okay, see. thank you. And uh, so, um, let me see, where everything. Infecting people, yeah, okay. Possibilities are, it's going to come around two or three times. So are we going to lock down every two or three, every, every time it comes around? I've just read Spain, that get 60 million tourists a year have closed their external borders until October. So if it comes back in October, do they close them? And this kind of goes on and on. And we're stuck in this river of agreement, uh, like the medical experts won't allow your trials to be done, even with volunteers. I mean, people volunteer for all sorts of dangerous projects. But we're in this river of, of consent, of agreement, where, and to, and to get out of that will take an economic vice when the second lockdown comes around in October. And we've, we've never had a corona vaccine, right? 
And uh, so we may not have one this time next year. Well, we might not have an effective one. So trying stuff that might work on a small scale and, and kind of getting outside our um, expert led. And for me, there are a lot of similarities between, and I'm, I certainly don't agree with President Trump. So, sorry, so what is the question here? Well, the question is, as, as, as a society that we're stuck in this thing that we won't change how, how we approach a problem. We leave it to the experts and, you know, and then uh, and they come up with new, uh, you know, complications all the time. They don't leave, you know, so I'm kind of, I enjoyed listening to you and uh, to somebody who's kind of thinking uh, laterally rather than hierarchically as, as we all think as a herd, we're, we are a herd, <laughs> you know. So thank you, that's all, so I rambled. So I'll, I can address two points there. Uh, on the second point of being, you know, enthralled to experts, um, the topic uh, that the host mentioned of prediction markets in Futarchy is an attempt to create a more flexible institution to allow people to decide for themselves when they're relatively expert on a topic and contribute to our shared consensus so that we could have more accurate estimates on this topic and many others. Uh, you mentioned before about we're not so sure that um, you know, we, there won't be more lockdowns later. There's two potential reasons for that. One is that we only allow a small percentage of people to be infected and then it grows again and then we have to lock down for that. There's the other issue of whether or not uh, people have long-term immunity. So it's possible, for example, that immunity will be shorter. Now, when you recover, that means your immune system at that moment is making you immune because that's how you recover, but that immunity might not last. So for example, it might only be a year or something. Uh, but a shorter term immunity doesn't take away the advantage of variolation. It just means that the time scale is changed. Now, instead of this one time choice between say locking down and being infected or different ways to be infected, now it's a choice you have to make every year. Uh, you know, how many lockdowns to have per year and how much, um, you know, uh, what, what kind of deliberate infection perhaps to allow. And again, the, the larger the stakes here, the more valuable it would be to cut uh, the death rate and other uh, harm rate by a factor of three to 30. Uh, if this comes back every year, we definitely, even more so, if we aren't going to have a vaccine for a long time, want a way to cut that harm. Okay. Uh, I think we can take one more question, if you don't mind, and then pass it on to Corey Doctorow. So, El Dubu, you have the mic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed hearing from you, Rob, and enjoy your work. Um, in my conversations with just my peers, family, and friends about this topic, um, conceptually, uh, that you know, when the conversation starts, everybody's kind of horrified by the idea, and then, sort of, you know, after I've given them my understanding of it, um, that what it really comes down to is is I guess a question about, so there's this hero hotel, you walk in and you get infected with some d dose of the virus. And at some point the end game is you walk out. But the question ultimately that everybody and myself trips over is what's the definitive test that allows you to get out? Uh, because what we're getting right now is a lot of conflicting information about whether or not it's even understood whether if you've been infected, you can be infectious again, or whether or not immunity is conferred by some level of infection, right? So if, if symptoms are a function of dose, then it seems like there's still a question about is immunity a function of dose? So are, do you feel like that that's a hurdle we've got to get over first before we can really try this out? No. <laughs> uh, I agree that the more we can know about who's immune uh, and how, the better. But we already now have to face this choice of, of who's recovered and what to let them do. There are now people who get the disease and they are sick and then they seem to recover. And we have to decide what to do with those people. And we do the best we can with what we have. And no doubt, if our uh, tests are error prone, then we will be error prone in those choices. But there's no choice we have to do something there. 
And if most people are going to get infected, well, we have to do something with most everybody who gets infected. So this deliberate infection doesn't make that problem worse. Uh, it's a problem for whether people get accidentally infected or deliberately infected. So again, the key choice is if most everybody's going to be infected, that's the plan B scenario, uh, then do you want them to be accidentally infected or do you want them to be deliberately infected? Things that are bad in both cases don't tell you which one to do. Great. Thank you so much, Robin, uh, for your talk and for sharing this concept with us. Uh, I know you've been you've been talking in different places about this. So I don't know. Are, are you are, are you planning on perhaps partnering with with um, a healthcare research uh, there, team? There, there's actually already um, dozens of people out there in various capacities who are trying to pursue this at the moment. And of course, they have a lot more medical expertise and uh, or institutional support than I do. So hmm. um, if trials happen, they will be the people who probably oversee it. And in is fact, if they, publish, in, is this in the if they publish academic articles, they'll probably get the publications too. You know, academia doesn't really care if you're the first person to write about something. They care if you're the first person in their field to write about it because right, academics right. publish the people in their field. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the attempts of, 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 of you know, variolation is are, are they mostly in the US or are you seeing these outside? Of the I, I know people from around the world. So okay. cool. But, you know, unfortunately, they don't want to be known. Many of them don't want to be known in public because uh, they're afraid of getting backlash from these review boards will punish them and not approve their things all the more if they get in the press and seem to be combative and, uh, you know, disagreeing with them. So, uh, you know, it's basically a very authoritarian area where people are very afraid to speak out in public uh, for fear of repression. Hmm. Well, thanks again, and thanks for being a part of this. Our next speaker is Cory Doctorow, and Cory Doctorow, uh, I'm sure everybody here uh, 